we've been doing a series here that we've been calling the Scarlet Thread. We've been tracing blood all through Scripture. Uh, it has been said that the Bible is sewn together uh, with the Scarlet Thread that is Jesus Christ. That all about Him, it all points to Him. <clears throat> and what would life be without a technical difficulty? Older. Let's see. Hopefully this will come on up. So in the last message, you may recall, we were in Genesis chapter 22. And we were talking about the testing of Abraham. Abraham was told to take his son Isaac, the son of promise, and he was told to take him to a mountain in Moriah and to offer him there as a burnt offering. And we have these very prophetic words of Abraham. He said, God will provide a lamb for himself. And, of course, in the immediate context, he does. There's a ram that's miraculously caught by his horns in the thicket. And so Abraham takes that ram and offers it in the place of his son. And prophetically speaking, in the long term, of course, uh, God did provide a lamb for himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the New Testament, we have John the Baptist saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And one of the themes here that we see over and over again, one that is clearly taught in the book of Hebrews, is that the blood of animals, of bulls and goats and so forth, could never take away sin. They are all pictures that point forward to the ultimate one time for all time sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to move forward on that theme. And to be frank, uh, this will be a little bit of a different message. Um, for one thing, I am going to attempt to cover the span of 13 chapters in one message, <laughs> which kind of seems like a fool's errand, but I think we can actually do it. Um, I'm confident enough to try to at least attempt it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read chapter 37 here. This is going to be the base scripture for the message here today. And then I'm also going to jump around a lot. So I've said this before, but if you're old enough to remember the old 9x yellow pages, let your fingers do the walking. Well, today, our fingers better have their running shoes on. <clears throat> All right. Disaster averted. I think my computer is going to cooperate. My pulpit glasses, I'm not so sure about. There we go. All right. As we look at Genesis chapter 37, the word of God says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? 
Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come and to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to them, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go over to Dothan. So Joseph went and his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that, it might, that he might rescue the, him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Galid, with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. When Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by. And they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. <clears throat> when Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and where shall I go? Then they took <clears throat> Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father, and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. And with that, let's pray. <coughs> father, as we come to this fairly difficult text, as always, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us. And Father, in your providence, I ask that this word will go about the business and achieve the work that you have intended it uh, to have and to accomplish. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So as I said, we're going to cover a lot of ground here. And I feel compelled, as I have in the previous messages, to provide a little bit of background here. Okay. So we're going to move fairly quickly, hopefully, but I want to make sure that we have all the details that we need to put some of this stuff together. Uh, so in the previous message, we had talked about Abraham. And so Abraham, of course, had his son Isaac, the child of promise, the one that all the blessings were to pass down through. Isaac, in turn, had two sons, uh, Jacob and Esau. And through God's providence, uh, Jacob becomes the child of promise, if you will, at that point, and all of the covenants and the blessings of God are then passed on down to Jacob. Uh, Jacob returns to his father's native land, uh, reunites with some of the family there, and his uncle Laban really rakes him over the coals. So Jacob 
uh, whose name actually means deceiver or one who grabs the heel, uh, had to have a lot of uh, education from valuable life lessons. And part of that was some of the way, same ways that he dealt with his brother were turned around and used on him and his uncle uh, really used him pretty hard. So Jacob learned a lot of valuable life lessons and really grew as a person through some of those dealings. In the course of that time, he had fallen in love with, Rachel's, uh, with Rachel, who is Laban's daughter. Uh, Laban tricked him into actually marrying both of his daughters, and the family life gets really, really complicated because they also, in their battle to outdo each other having children, basically, they gave uh, Jacob, each one of them, a slave woman as well. So to make a long story short, Jacob ends up having 12 children by four different wives, okay? And so the uh, opportunity here for sibling rivalry and favoritism and so forth is, is pretty ripe here in this situation. And so obviously, as we read in the text, uh, Rachel was, Joseph, was Jacob's favorite wife, and her two sons were Joseph and Benjamin. And so Jacob showed extreme favoritism, as we read here in the text, towards Joseph. He makes him his own special coat, and of course his brothers come to resent him very deeply to the point of actually hating him. Um, I'm going to refer to this as it has been traditionally, which is the coat of many colors, simply because it rolls off my tongue a lot more naturally. Uh, it, in fact, could be a robe, and it could be something that was embroidered, rather than us picturing something that's like many fabrics woven together. Uh, but the point here is, is this special robe set Joseph apart and symbolizes uh, his status with their father, uh, uh, which doesn't help how the brothers feel about him. On top of that, we read the account where uh, he gave a bad report back to their father about what the brothers were doing. We're not told what it was, uh, but in their eyes, he was also a tattletale, which didn't help their opinion of him one bit. Uh, to add insult to injury, he starts having these dreams, and instead of keeping them to himself, in his youth and in his arrogance, he decides to share it with his brothers. And this may actually be a play on Joseph's name because the name Joseph means to add to. And him reporting his dreams did nothing but add to the hatred that they already felt for him. And uh, the term here that's uh, translated even more is actually very similar in Hebrew to Joseph's name. So it appears the Holy Spirit is actually using a play on words there with Joseph's name. So... They hate him. And remember our conversation that we had when we talked about Cain and Abel with the extreme danger of feeling hatred or ill will towards others in your heart. Jesus equated it with murder because it very often, given the right circumstances, will lead to exactly that. So you can't help here but return to the Cain and Abel story because we have this ill will between brothers and the bulk of the narrative here is going to take place where? In the field. And remember that's where Cain killed his brother Abel. And so we see a lot of language that is used here that I think is to draw us back to those earlier situations. Uh, it's a fallen world and life as a human being in a, in a <coughs> fallen world gets extremely messy. And the Bible does not conceal any of this. Some of these family situations uh, were not very good at all. But God does what he does with them. Uh, so here they are after all these dreams. Uh, the brothers just want to get rid of him. Uh, that's pretty plain. And so they actually start uh, plotting to kill him. Reuben, who is the oldest, he would have been the firstborn, uh, but Reuben actually forfeited his status as the firstborn because he brought shame upon his father because he actually had an affair with one of Jacob's other wives. Um, and so therefore he lost his privilege as the firstborn. 
Levi and Simeon, in turn, uh, lost their right to that firstborn status once Reuben was removed because of how they dealt with the people in Shechem. Because of the way they had treated their sister, they went in and they actually wiped out an entire city. And so, for that reason, they forfeited their status. The next in line would have been Judah. And so we're going to see here as we move forward, a lot of what is contained here shows how Judah came into that role as the firstborn in status. And of course, this is very important <clears throat> later on because Judah is the namesake of the tribe from which the Lord Jesus himself comes from. And we see a lot of pictures here that are pointing forward to the Lord Jesus, which we will talk about. <clears throat> so Judah, and you know, this is a process here. Judah is not a great guy. We're going to see that. And then, like a lot of people, he kind of grows as he ages and gains a little bit of wisdom. Uh, but Judah has this great idea. Hey, why kill him when we can actually make some money off of this deal? Uh, still not a great idea, but at least they didn't kill him. And so they sell him to these slave traders who are coming through for 20 pieces of silver, which is the cost of a slave uh, during that time. So to cover the crime, uh, so that they don't have to own up to what happened to their father, they kill a goat and dip the coat of many colors into the blood, and they will just lay, let Jacob basically see it and put all the pieces together and come to his own conclusions, okay? Um, so that way it kind of gets them off the hook for what happened to their brother and their father goes into extreme mourning uh, because obviously he loved Joseph a great deal uh, and he tears his clothes, the text says. And we see that anytime somebody is feeling extreme grief, okay? It's a, it's a literary point where they're so upset they're tearing their clothes off and that's the visual picture that's being uh, created here. So meanwhile, Joseph is on his way to Egypt. So now, next comes chapter 38. And so I'm going to try to condense this down here a little bit. Now actually, it seems fairly odd that all of a sudden the Holy Spirit shifts gears, uh, seemingly without even using the clutch. And now we go to this story about Judah. Okay, right in the middle of this narrative about Joseph. But as I said, this is very important because this is showing us the progression morally of how Judah grows as a person. So chapter 38 tells the story of the birth of Judah's sons, Zerah and Perez. So Judah has three sons already named Ur, Onan, and Shelah. And so Ur takes for a wife this lady named Tamar, okay? The text tells us in chapter 38 that Ur was wicked in the sight of God, so he kills him. So here's the thing with that, okay? We know why he died because the text tells us explicitly he was wicked in the eyes of the Lord. So we know why God decided to take his life. But this is a picture of somebody who receives justice instead of grace, okay? And we see that in Scripture. Uh, God is so gracious that I think at times we come to just simply expect him to be gracious all the time. But sometimes he is just instead, and this was the case with Ur. We're not told why. So, in those times, having children was extremely important. And having an heir was very, very important. So uh, there's a concept that would come about in the law later and be solidified in the law that was given to Moses uh, that was known as Levite marriage. So it was the duty of a brother, if the brother died without children, for his brother to step into his place, take the woman as wife, and then bring up children that would be counted as the deceased children so that they would have an heir, and so that the family name could keep going. Uh, Onan decides he doesn't want that, probably out of greed, because he didn't want to have to split his inheritance up with anybody else. So he sabotages the plan for Tamar to have children, and therefore, 
uh, God th then strikes him dead as well. So we're down to just Sheila left. By now, Judah is getting a little bit suspicious here. He's probably starting to think Tamar is a black widow or something, and he doesn't want anything to happen, presumably, to his last remaining son. So he tells Tamar, hey, when he gets to be of age and he's old enough, then we'll go through with it. But in the meantime, you know, he's young and this or that. So Tamar waits and nothing happens. And Judah never actually gives Sheila to her to take as husband, which leaves her with no children as a widow. So Tamar takes matters into her own hands. She, dis she disguises herself as a prostitute. And to kind of keep the story brief here, Basically, Judah ends up conducting business with her, promises to give her a young goat, and then as pledge, gives him some personal effects to prove um, who it was that owed her the money. Now, he doesn't recognize her. She's in disguise as a cult prostitute. And so she is found to be pregnant with Judah's child. And so word gets around that, hey, out of immorality, your daughter-in-law is now pregnant. Well, Judah's verdict is immediate. He's like, well, let's burn her, which is very hypocritical considering what uh, has taken place here. So anyway, he goes to her. There are his personal effects, which obviously means that it's his child that she is carrying. And actually, she is pregnant with twins. So at the end of the story here, as the twins are being born, uh, one of the twins puts his arm out first. They tie a scarlet thread onto his arm to mark him as the firstborn. But his arm gets drawn back in, and then his brother Perez is born first. So through God's providence, Perez is actually born first, even though it looked like his brother Zero was going to be born first. And so Judah's son, Perez, is counted as the firstborn. This is very, very important because, as we've said, this is the lineage of the Messiah from Judah through his son, Perez. And very, very graciously, if you look at Matthew chapter 1, when we look at the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, all these people are listed, including Tamar. So God is very, very gracious. Sometimes, as I said, human life is very messy and complicated, but we worship a great God, and he is extremely gracious. And so uh, here they are all involved in uh, the genealogy of Jesus Christ himself. So now we go back to Egypt. Joseph has been sold as a slave there. He belongs to a man named Potiphar, who we just read is the captain of the guard. So Joseph is a diligent and faithful servant. Everything he touches turns to gold. God blesses everything that he does because God is with him. And so everything prospers. And there's nothing in his household that uh, Potiphar hasn't put under Joseph's charge. Uh, the problem is, is Potiphar's wife has taken a liking to Joseph. Apparently, he was a fairly attractive young man. And she keeps trying to seduce him. And he keeps resisting her and saying, no, I will not sin against God by doing this. Uh, he points out that Potiphar has withheld nothing from me but you, and I'm not going to do it. So what she does instead is she falsely accuses him of assaulting her. So here's Joseph doing the right thing, being a good guy, and he gets falsely accused and thrown into prison. Well, this is very, very important providentially because in the prison, Joseph also becomes an important pe person. God blesses everything that he does. And while he's in prison, he has the opportunity to help uh, these two servants of the king. So they have dreams and God gives Joseph the ability to interpret these dreams. Now, I'm not going to go into detail here just for the sake of time. But Joseph tells the cupbearer that his dream means that he will be restored to his, current, to his former position uh, in three days. And then he tells the baker that he will be basically impaled on a pole in three days. 
And guess what? Both of their dreams come true. So after the cupbearer returns to the king, uh, he was asked by Joseph to say, hey, help get me out of here and tell, uh, tell Pharaoh what's been going on and try to get me out of here. Well, the cupbearer forgets all about it until Pharaoh starts having some dreams. And so Pharaoh has uh, a dream where there's these seven skinny ears of grain, uh, okay? And they're eating up seven plump uh, ears of grain. And so Joseph is able to interpret these dreams. So basically he gets called up out of the prison because the cupbearer remembers, hey, there was this guy when I was in prison and he could, he could interpret these dreams. So again, condensed Reader's Digest version, Joseph tells Pharaoh there's going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And so Pharaoh is so overwhelmed that Joseph has this ability to know what's going to happen. He puts Joseph in charge of everything. So Joseph goes from prison, literally, to the second in command of Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world at that time, and he comes up with a plan. We're going to take everything that we have from the seven years of plenty, we're going to put up stores of it, and then we'll have plenty to last us during the seven years of famine. And because he knew what was coming, he was able to plan this all out. They built barns, they built stockyards, they built all these places to hold all of this extra food they were going to get in the first seven years. And so as it ends up, the only place anywhere in that region that had any food during the Great Famine was Egypt. And so people came from everywhere to Egypt to try to find food because there wasn't any elsewhere to be had. So here we go, we rejoin our story here with the brothers. So like everybody else, the brothers had to go to Egypt to find food. So they come down to Egypt, and there's Joseph, second in command, but they don't recognize him. And this is realistic, because years and years have gone by, okay? And so here's Joseph, he's dressed uh, according to Egyptian culture and so on and so forth. They don't know it's their brother. <clears throat> so Joseph initially accuses them of being spies. Of course, Joseph knows full well who they are. And they're like, no, no, we're honest men, which may have been a bit of a stretch. <laughs> so anyway, he keeps uh, basically trying to get all this information from them, and they say, yes, you know, we're the sons of our father, and we have another brother, and he's home with our father. And so basically, Joseph tells them that when they come back, he wants them to bring their little brother with him and that they will not see his face unless they show back up there with his little brother, Benjamin. And so this is where we pick this all up because they don't want to do that and they know they're going to find themselves in big trouble here when they have to come back with their brother because they're really afraid that Joseph, uh, Jacob rather, is not going to take this well. Okay, And of course, their consciences are absolutely killing them, right? Uh, because they know what they've done to their brother. They're still feeling the guilt about what they've done to their brother. And you know how it is when you feel guilty about something. Um, at least I do. So Genesis 42 and 21 says, Then they said to one another, In truth we are guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come on us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen, so now there comes a reckoning for his blood. And remember what we read back in Genesis 9 about the sanctity of human life and about how God says, I will require it of every man who sheds the blood of man, right? And so we see this similar language being used here, pointing us back to what has already occurred earlier in Genesis. To make matters worse, they have to leave Simeon as pledge. And then one of them finds the money for the food that they brought in the mouth of his sack. So things are getting worse and worse here, right? 
So they have to leave one, one brother as pledge behind. And now they think when they come back, they're going to be accused of stealing because the money they had to pay for the grain was found in the mouths of their sacks. And so they are just absolutely squirming here. Uh, we read about this in verse 27 of chapter 42. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. He said to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this, their hearts failed, and they turned trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God has done to us? Mm -hmm. So we notice here that everything that happens to them becomes a form of judgment, right? When you have a guilty conscience, doesn't it feel that way? I mean, if one of their sheep got sick and died, they would have been like, yep, there we go. This is all because of what we did to Joseph. They come out one morning and their truck won't start. See, it's because we did, did what we did to Joseph. It doesn't matter what's going on. They're so guilty that everything becomes a form of judgment. And I think probably a lot of us can relate to that type of of feeling when we feel really, really, really guilty about something. So their consciences are just absolutely eating them alive. The blood of the goat that they killed may have provided a story. It may have kept them from having to confess what they had done to their father. But the blood of that goat has done absolutely nothing to cleanse their consciences or to do away with their guilt. And that is the picture here. We are seeing illustrated for us here uh, what the book of Hebrews makes explicit, which is the blood of animals could never, ever remove our sin. And, and on and on it goes. <clears throat> so they do what they have to do. They go back and they tell Jacob that they have to take Benjamin down to Egypt with them to get any more grain. Otherwise, they're not even going to get spoken to. They have to bring Benjamin down. And so Jacob says, absolutely not. It will take me to the grave if I lose yet another son. So Judah offers himself as a pledge in chapter 43, verse 8. And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would now have returned twice. And so we start to see here this idea, Judah being willing to offer himself as a substitute. Is this pointing us in any direction here? Uh, I certainly think that it does. So they return to Egypt with Benjamin, and Joseph's test of his brothers comes to fruition. So everything is in place here, and this provides the opportunity for Joseph to judge his brothers' hearts. Have they changed at all? Are these still the same group of guys that were willing uh, at one time to kill him? and then at least to sell him into slavery. And so basically the test, if you will, is all set up. And as they leave, Joseph puts his silver cup into Benjamin's sack and the trap is set. So they go ahead and they leave Egypt, uh, but they get pulled over on the way back. And basically, <coughs> This servant of Joseph's is like, hey, one of you stole my master's silver cup. And they're like, no, we didn't. We didn't steal it. They said, whoever is found with it, let him die and we will be your servants. And so it is said to them, let it be so. Whoever is found to be in possession of the cup, he will be my servant. And so, of course, they find the silver cup in Benjamin's bag. And, of course, the brothers are right beside themselves. They're, the text says at this point they are in such dismay and mourning that they are tearing their clothes at this point. And so they go back to Egypt. <clears throat> 
They go on to say, Now therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up with the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy, Benjamin, is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant, because a pledge of safety for the boy of my father, saying, so this is Judah speaking here, and he is say, telling Joseph that he pledged <coughs> himself toward the safety of Benjamin. If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. So my how things have changed. Judah has grown to the point now where he is willing to take Benjamin's place and to stay behind as a slave so that he does not cause any more hurt to his father. And at this point, Joseph cannot contain himself anymore. Uh, and in verse 3 of chapter 45, And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. So imagine what must be going through their head. First off, uh, Joseph's dream has come true. Because when his brothers returned, they all bowed down before him, just as he had dreamed they would do. They, of course, are scared out of their wits because now they find out not only is Joseph alive, he's the second most powerful man in the nation of Egypt. Joseph could have just snapped his fingers and said the word, and these guys would have been done for. Just like that, no questions asked. But that's not what he does. And I have to tell you here, his mercy and forgiveness that he shows towards his brothers here is nothing short of exemplary. I have tried to put myself into his shoes. The fear of being sold to these slave traders, brought down to Egypt, not knowing what's going to happen to him. The roller coaster ride of being uh, a servant of Potiphar, then being pro thrown into prison, which he didn't deserve. And then, not only does he not grow bitter and lose hope, he continues to ride everything out, and of course, God providentially raises him to a very, very high position. But I've got to tell you, I think I'd be pretty ticked. <laughs> but the mercy that he shows to his brothers here is amazing. Uh, continuing to read here in chapter 45, verse 4. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me you and your children and your children's children, and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. So we see here providentially that God has actually used this horrible situation not only to preserve the lives of all the people that would become the nation of Israel, because these 12 brothers are the namesakes of the tribes of Israel. All of God's promises that he made to Abraham hinge on, these, on this family. So it is very, very important that they be preserved. This is also how they come to be in Egypt uh, at the time of the Exodus. Because God told Abraham 
that they would be in a foreign land for 400 years and then he would bring them back to the land of Canaan. So this is simply God continuing to fulfill all of his promises through and despite evil human action taking place here. So basically Jacob does come down, he blesses all of his sons and then it gets to the time when Jacob dies. When Jacob passes away, the brothers are terrified all over again because they're like, well, now that our father is not here, well, maybe now Joseph will seek to take revenge on us finally. And of course, that is not the case. <clears throat> but they sent a message to Joseph. I'm reading here in verse 16 of chapter 50. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of our father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear. For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And so we see this amazing forgiveness here demonstrated by Joseph. And quite frankly, this is the same forgiveness that any brother and sister in Christ is called to also demonstrate. This forgiveness that we see pictured here. Uh, also, circumstances at times can appear to be very, very bleak, very, very difficult, at sometimes frustrating. But I can think of just a couple of scenarios uh, of a couple of brothers where they had some health difficulties and some circumstances that left them in the hospital for a prolonged period of time, where they got to witness to uh, non-believers, or they got to uh, minister to other believers that were in the hospital because of the circumstances when they were left there. So one of the things I guess I've learned over the years is when something bad, it seems, is happening to me, Instead of, you know, saying, what was me or why me? Uh, I start to look around and I try to figure out what is, what is God up to? What am I supposed to get out of this? Or what am I supposed to be doing in these circumstances? Because the Lord truly works in mysterious ways. And we don't, only, we don't always know what he's up to. And so we are put in the position sometimes where we just have to trust him and trust the fact that he is going to bring some good out of it, even when we don't see or we don't understand how that could be possible. But this is, in fact, exactly what he promises in Romans 8.28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And so I tell you, this is one of the most important promises for believers, I think, in all of the scriptures. And it's up to us just simply to believe it, uh, to trust in the character of God and believe ultimately he has our good at heart, uh, even through difficult times. Uh, perhaps the greatest, and I don't say perhaps, I say the greatest example of, ev of evil being turned to good is in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And Peter actually teaches this in the book of Acts in chapter 3. He says to the Jews, But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins 
may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. And so we see here, even though evil men plotted and put the Lord Jesus Christ to death, it was God's plan before the foundation of the world that Jesus would die to save sinners. So we may ask ourselves, how does this work? How can God foreordain something to come to pass, and yet the people that perpetrate it still be guilty for their transgressions? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. And I have to be honest with you, I would seriously question anybody else that knows how that all works either. But we do know this. The Bible clearly teaches both things. God is sovereign and we are responsible. But even those people as that Peter is preaching to, even those who are responsible for the very murder of the Lord Jesus can be forgiven if they simply turn back to him and repent of their sins confess their sins and put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that pictured in little bits and pieces all through the story of Joseph, the forgiveness that's available. We see the repentance of Judah and how he became a changed man who was actually willing to sacrifice himself for his brothers uh, in the long term. And so, again, we put it out there. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only hope that any of us is ever going to have. And if you have not trusted in him, I would beg you to do so today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that it contains. And quite frankly, Father, uh, one of the ways I know it's the truth is you didn't sugarcoat anything. Uh, some of this stuff is downright messy. Uh, but it's a good reminder to us, too. That no matter who we are and what kind of a mess we hail from, uh, we can be your children. All can be forgiven, and you can use any situation and any happening ultimately for our good and for your glory. Uh, Father, we ask you to touch the hearts of all here today uh, and that your word would have your way with them. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And thank you, folks. I know we covered a lot of ground today.